Welcome to a Creative Approach Podcast. I'm your host, Karen poirier Brody. Starting this season has presented me with many challenges. The website may not appear much different, but it should be far more user-friendly. You'll notice that this season brings a three-week interval between shows. There's a lot of work in a basically one-person production. Now, I have excellent help and a small team, but I don't have a personal assistant. And this is a self-funded show, and I do a lot, obviously, myself. Now, if I do decide to hire an assistant, we may be able to increase the frequency of episodes. When the Digi Scrap Geek podcast ended, the show I used to be on, I knew I had to keep podcasting. However, it's a lot different doing a solo show versus one with three other people. And over three years of podcasting, I've learned a lot. Still have room to grow in this field. Now, podcasting is a labor of love, and I believe you feel the excitement I have when I have these conversations with our guests. Sharing the lives of creative people with you is what keeps me doing this. Now, today's podcast has definitely a fascinating guest. Jonathan Fong is a continuous fountain of ideas. Hmm, fountain. They're pretty abundant, but you know, geysers. And now that really makes me think of a big flow. So perhaps we should say a gifted geyser of artistic expression. Hope that's not too much hyperbole, Jonathan, but I think it's so true. He's great. From plans for kids' projects to ideas for sophisticated weddings, Jonathan just shines. Home decorating, crafting, and entertainment are not just things he knows about. He has a unique gift to teach us how to master his creative visions. I love that Jonathan always dresses impeccably and adds unique touches to his ensemble. Oop, there's the Canadian coming out. I think in American we'd say ensemble. I believe that Jonathan's approach proves that men's fashions can be both original and very dapper. Now, Jonathan has a great motto that I love. Live life as if you were in a movie. Of course, his movie is Xanadu. Join me now in my conversation to learn more about the innovative Jonathan Fong and his creative approach. Well, welcome to a Creative Approach podcast. I am very happy to have Jonathan Fong with me today. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Karen. Welcome to the show. And Jonathan is a media celebrity and a craft expert, and very, very innovative, imaginative, creative. Uh, I mean, just have to have Jonathan on a show called A Creative Approach, of course. So, Thank you. What a nice introduction. Well, thank you. But I am really excited to have you here. And I thought, well, you've done, I think we had a brief conversation, and you've said you've done so many things, which is true. So <laughs> I... I was hoping that maybe the audience, though, could learn a little bit about maybe what you're up to now and some of the things you've been doing recently, and then maybe we can kind of go into your story. All right. Well, many things you know, that I do are uh, everything from uh, interior design to floor design to events. Uh, I do a lot of the online content for companies, tutorials uh, and videos. Uh, I have a, a YouTube channel, and I love kind of broadcasting ideas and inspiration to people. That's great. So a bit of an actor as well. I guess so. I, I actually was in a movie once many years ago, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> Not that one. They didn't get you up for a part in Crazy Rich Asians, I guess. I'm looking forward to the movie. I love the book. Yeah, me too. So basically, you've been doing all this your whole adult life, I assume. No. No. Where did you come from before you got in this creative world? Yeah, well, I think I've been a little bit creative, but I didn't really become like, like this designer uh, until you know later on. So this is kind of like a second or third career for me, really. Oh. Yeah, I, I started off in uh, advertising, and I was a market researcher in an advertising agency. So I, I started off very left brain uh, yeah, because – very corporate. Yes, I was very corporate. You know, it was the, the late 80s. I was very corporate because I went to business school. I, went, I have an MBA from Boston University. That was a little bit more of what was expected of me. You know, from with my you know, Asian background, I pretty much specialized in academics growing up. And I, I didn't really flex a, a 
creative bone in my body. So, you know, all through school, I, I was very, you know, analytical. And uh, when I got out of grad school, I went into the business world and I was a, a market researcher. I, I chose a creative field. It was advertising, but I didn't have a creative job in the advertising. You know, I, I did focus groups and quantitative studies. Uh, it was very analytical. Uh, so you know, I did that for a few years, and I was a little conflicted in it. You know, my boss at the time even said that I had a left brain, right brain conflict because I was really trying to be creative in a non-creative field. And I tried to have some fun with it, you know, but I hit roadblocks. And even the way I dressed, I hit roadblocks. Well, you like a little bit more style, and I love it. <laughs> Yes, they kind of wanted me to be a little bit more buttoned up and suit and tie. So I uh, I went back to school and I decided that if I was going to work in an ad agency, I was going to work on the creative side. So I decided to become a copywriter, you know, which is the person who like writes all the headlines and writes the scripts for the commercials and the radio commercials. So you know, I did that. You know, I put a portfolio together and I got a job as a copywriter at an ad agency. So that was way more creative. It was, it was a great job. It was creative, but it still wasn't the visual. I, mean, I was concentrating on the words. So uh, even then, you know, I did not get to design like the way that I do now. Right. But all of this sounds like great background for launching off into the more visual creative style. Yes. I'm grateful for everything that I've done in the past because it, it all applies you know, I didn't think it was a waste of time. It was, in fact, it was a wonderful, wonderful training. It made me a little bit smarter and practical, I think, in going after my career. So after several years of working my way up, you know, I became a creative director at an ad agency and, uh, you know, it was a great job. But, you know, my boss at the time had a great philosophy. <laughs> he said that if you have like these huge creative tendencies, explore them but don't try to take it out on your work at the ad agency because at the, the ad agency is a business. And, you know, I was selling chicken and I was selling uh, memberships to health clubs and diet plans and cruises. So it was a business and we had to be practical in what we were doing for our clients. So if you want to do some far out thing, the client's not going to buy it. But you can do that in your own free time. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I did. And I had just bought a house. It was a brand new house that I had no furniture to start because I didn't have any money. And I just started doing things to the house and experimenting with decorating. And I had never really decorated before. But because I didn't have any experience, I kind of broke rules and did the things that I liked. And yeah, after I decorated my whole townhouse, I got invited to be on this show on HGTV, uh, the Kitty Bartholomew show. And that kind of started everything. So someone had seen your home and said, Jonathan, you need to be on this show? Yeah, this friend of mine knew somebody at HGTV and said, you know, you, you really need to be on there. Uh, so uh, a producer called me and said, I heard, heard you have an interesting house. Can we come see it? And I said, sure. And you know, I didn't really think that highly of my house at the time. I thought it was really creative and kind of interesting. But, you know, it wasn't this high end, beautiful show palace like like you <laughs> see sometimes on TV. Yeah, but it was your personal expression, right? <laughs> yeah. So they came in. They, they liked all the interesting ideas because everything was a like a. A how to tutorial in every room. <laughs> so they filmed me and they filmed me doing a demonstration, which was really exciting because that was like my Martha Stewart moment and uh, to be able to be on TV and, and do a demonstration. I was so nervous. My legs were just shaking, but it was like my first foray into that. And uh, when after the show aired, everything kind of blew up. I was getting emails from all over and I didn't think that people really necessarily like my style because, you know, it's very modern. It's a little wacky, but people like from all over the country liked it, said they were inspired by it. I was able to track emails and like within minutes of the show airing, people were contacting me. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> so, great. Uh, it, it was unbelievable. Uh, so that changed my life. And I started doing more things on HGTV. And then I decided that you know I would write a book because 
you know, why not, right? <laughs> of course. But with even lots of ideas, it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I had a lot of ideas. So I wrote a book proposal. Uh, I, I bought this book from Amazon called you know, How to Write a Book Proposal. And I followed it to the letter. And I you know, realized that, you know, when you write a nonfiction book, you don't have to actually write the entire book. You just have to write a marketing document about you know, who your target audience will be, who your competition is. And it's basically a marketing document. And I had experience writing those uh, working in advertising. So it was very easy to write a book proposal. And then I found an agent and we went to New York. And uh, I was going to New York anyway to see Broadway shows. And but my agent said, well, while you're Me there. Me too. I, I'm glad you have that passion. Oh, yeah. So while we were there, you know, we met with some publishers. And then I got a, a, a three-book deal. And then that's when I left advertising because I knew I would have to devote like a few years of my life to do the books. So that's kind of how it all started. And are the books available? Uh, yeah. They're uh, Walls That Wow, Flowers That Wow, and parties that wow, because I wanted to do the whole realm of home right. rather than just wall treatments. I want to do uh, flowers because you know, I, I love to do floral arrangements that are easy for people. And uh, I also did the parties book uh, because you know, I have a lot of party ideas and since I do a lot of events and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's right. People can just go to Amazon to find these books, I was, would imagine. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they've been around for so long that you can get them for like a dollar, probably. <laughs> well, no problem, though. But I mean, people are going to want to know where they can find things. So good. So head to Amazon, get a deal on the book because they've been around a long time. But I'm sure they're full of great ideas because uh, oh, yeah. you yeah. always have the most fun things. When I first met Jonathan, I think it was because of the great sneakers. You were putting designs on sneakers and I was pretty wowed. Yes, that was with a craft attitude when you know, when I was a spokesperson for a couple of years there. Yeah, that was cool. And you even had it on some jackets and stuff. Oh, yeah. I put it on everything. Yeah. Well, you coordinated your lapels with your, your shoes, I think, or something. It was wonderful. But yeah, but great, clever ideas. So great. So those books. And so once you got the books going, what happened next? Because that took three years uh, to do the three books. And then it was like, well, now it's time to make some money because... <laughs> Doing books isn't that lucrative, and it took so much time I wasn't able to work. So then after that, you know, I, I just started doing you know, interior design for private clients because I was enjoying that, and you know, I was doing weddings and you know just anything that would pay, really. Not a bad strategy. Yeah. But then the recession hit. Uh, it was really hard. Yeah. For a couple of years there, it was hard, and you know because of my advertising and writing background, you know, I was fortunately able to uh, do a lot of freelance still in advertising and, and writing. Uh, so that helped pay the bills while I you know, kept pursuing the, you know, the creative field. And, and then I started a, a YouTube channel uh, because I had envisioned myself being on a TV show by then, uh, but it wasn't happening. As you know, the landscape of HGTV really changed and they were doing uh, more of these real estate shows and you weren't getting those fun DIY shows anymore. They just weren't doing that anymore. So I decided to create my own show. So I did that on uh, YouTube. And this is a good time to mention to people just how they can find your YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, it's well, it's called Style with a Smile. Okay. The show. And I think my YouTube channel is called Jay Fong Style. Okay. Because YouTube kind of changed the world. Uh, they democratized television, really. So I didn't have to rely on a network to sponsor me. I was able to create whatever content I wanted. And there are no longer gatekeepers keeping people out, which is why places like YouTube are so great for the universe. You can kind of take your destiny in your own hand. You're right in the middle of the recession. I said, well, I have the time. I'm going to create a YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, and just put stuff out there. And it was a really good thing. You know, it got me out there, you know, slowly. I remember like when I first, you know, put out my first video, it was like, of course, you know, nobody watches it because nobody knows you're out there. Right. <laughs> but slowly it builds. And it's, and it's an amazing thing that slowly it builds. And, and the wonderful thing about an online audience is that it's worldwide. If you're on a cable show, it's great. But the audience is very limited to the people in the United States who have that cable network. Right. Well, that's the great thing about any of these types, like 
being a podcaster. It yes. just goes out there and you can have a wide ranging audience. So that's a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a great showcase for me to be able to get out there. And then after a year or so of putting the shows out, a network in Israel contacted me okay. and said that they wanted to air my YouTube videos you know, as programming on their version of HGTV. It was called Home Plus. And you know, so they paid for the rights to air my little five-minute videos as interstitials on their network. Interstitials, for people who don't know, are the, the things that run can run during uh, commercial breaks. So between shows, my videos would run. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, yeah. And it ran there for about four years uh, on my little videos. And it just shows that the whole world is hungry for content. And you know, I would never have thought that I would be on television in Israel. Right. I mean, that wasn't a career goal. It was just something that happened. Yeah. And it was just wonderful that oh, I, I was yeah. exposed to this uh, brand new audience on the other side of the world. You know, I had been like recognized. That's just fabulous, though. I was at CHA a few years ago. That's the Craft and Hobby Association, now known as the Association for Creative Industries, for those who are listening. Sorry to keep yeah. interrupting, but I want to keep No, thank you. But yeah, I've uh, up that. And there. do you know Inat Kessler? I think I do. Yeah, she's a wonderful crafter, but I hadn't met her before. She came up to me there and said, do you know you're on television in Israel? And I said, I think I am, but I've never actually met anybody who's actually watched me there. And she said, oh, we, we watch you. We see you all the time. So that was just like the biggest thrill that yes. I met somebody who watched me. And then I've had you know fans give me screen captures of me from there uh, with the Hebrew subtitles, you know, to show me what it looks like. And so it's pretty fun. That's awesome. And that's all started uh, by just by creating my own content on YouTube. And then that led to a uh, co-hosting gig on a web series for Disney because they were doing a kid's crafting show and they saw the youtube videos and cast me from that i didn't even have to audition so you know when you create your path things can happen that you totally do not plan for right well and that must have been fun because you have such fun ideas i'm sure that was working with a kid audience they are so creative anyways and uh, tap into that yeah yeah you know, I, I had never done things for kids before so they asked you know, do you do kids crafts? And I said, well, of course I do. Well, <laughs> kids are people. Yeah, well, the, the, the things I do for adults are so whimsical and, and fun right. anyway. It was very easy to transition to kids crafts because we're all kids of all ages. So it was fun. And then I started doing a, a lot of content for the Disney website. That, that was a lot of fun. That kind of started me doing a lot of online content for companies. It was like a new industry. People needed content. Yeah, still do. Yeah. So that, that has been one of my, really my favorite thing to do now is to create content for websites. I do a lot of tutorials for ehow.com and I've probably done over 200 tutorials for them over the, the last few years. And it's everything from decorating projects to floral projects to uh, baking. Oh, wow. Now you're getting into yeah. the tasting part of things. But of course, if you're doing events... Yeah, but I never really cooked for the events before. But you had food at them, so I'm sure you knew what people wanted. Yeah. So how's that exploration of cooking? Uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, mainly it's been cupcakes and cake pops that I've been doing. A lot of dessert type things. In fact, today I'm making cake pops. Um, uh, that would be dangerous for me. Well, it's funny. I don't have much of a sweet tooth, so it's very easy for me. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I've just learned to cook in the past. Well, it's a little more than a year. I started off with in fact, I still use them, the food kits, you know, that come in the oh, mail. Oh, that, well, that's what I use, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that really, it's helped me learn to cook because I didn't oh, cook yeah. before then. Of course, I use some of the food channel. Uh -huh. I watch some of those shows, get some hints. But so you're into mainly doing, well, because those are cake pops and cupcakes are things you can really add a lot of creativity to. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's why I, I love to make them and then give them to people because people just love to eat them and look at the fun designs on them. Yeah, I, I see, you know, every popping up every so often on the internet, some really interesting ideas and go, hmm, maybe I should do that. But I haven't. Now I'm getting inspired. Maybe I should. Although 
I have a terrible sweet tooth. <laughs> like I said, could be dangerous. So food content and the party things, the flowers and things like that. So those are things people can go to eHow and find, you said, over 200 tutorials of different things that might help them create a fun party. Yeah, and, and I have things for every holiday. You know, every holiday they ask, okay, what are we doing this time for okay. holiday? Yeah, and I was, and for a while I was doing a lot of Facebook lives with them too. Uh huh. Well, that's cool. Yeah, so that was really fun. I love doing Facebook lives because you get interaction immediately with people, and you know, we really built a nice audience with that. That's great. So uh, I was thinking, how are there like people along the way who? influenced you in this? You said you grew up and, you know, you were sort of pushed into this uh, academic kind of world, but were there people around you who were terribly creative in your family or teachers or anyone that might have influenced you? Hmm. You know, uh, it's interesting. You know, even though, uh, you know, I have four siblings. I have two older brothers and two older sisters. And the oldest of them, you know, were very academic. One's uh, an engineer, one's like an accountant. But then the, on the next two, I have a sister who actually became a visual merchandise manager at a department store. So wow. she was doing displays and things. So, I, you know, so that there was somebody who had, you know, visual creativity. And then my brother, who's five years older than me, uh, he is actually a He's always been an artist. He was not good academically. And you know, he is a toy designer. Ooh. Yeah, he, he actually designed a lot of the Star Wars toys. And uh, now he's in the video game industry. So that was in the family. Yeah, especially that fun creativity. <laughs> yeah, it was never encouraged because my was always criticized by my parents. So I grew up with that criticism, you know, knowing that you know, they did not value that type of life. <laughs> oh. But that was in, you know, that's in the blood, I apparently. Uh, and in school, you know, I had this English teacher named Mrs. Stone, Ann Stone, who was my, you know, it, I think a lot of people have like the teacher in high school that influences them. And Mrs. Stone influenced me in my writing. Because really, my writing is what kind of launched me into the business world. You know, she kind of guided me in my writing. So I was able to write like really well. And you know, when I was in school, in grad school, I was able to write really well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that helps academically, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that got me into advertising, really, my ability to write. That kind of was the start of everything. So, you know, I, I credit her. And then my boss in advertising, you know, David Suisa, who founded his agency, and I worked for, with him for you know, many, many, many years, kind of helped me hone my creativity and you know, make it smart and strategic. So I have to credit him. And, uh, and then Kitty Bartholomew, who was the host of the HGTV show that I was on, uh, she kind of took me under her wing and really helped me kind of get started. And, you know, she was very, very generous and helping me and uh, showcasing me. And, you know, she wrote the intro to my first book. And, you know, she's a legend in the field. I mean, she, she was, oh, she is. Yes. Yeah. She, she did, did the original home show uh, when home shows wasn't in the consciousness uh, of America, but she was doing that before anybody. And to be able to meet her and to you know, learn from her and, and just have her support me was just incredible. So those are just some of the people, you know, uh, but I'll tell you a funny thing. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh -huh. the person who got me into crafting, because I was doing all this stuff, you know, uh, but I had not really crafted per se. You know, I was doing, you know, in the interior design and the events, and, uh, but I, I had never crafted. You know, when I went to the uh, Craft and Hobby Association shows, it was to promote my books because my publisher was sending me. Right. So I did not know the craft community, uh, the paper crafting, jewelry making, you know, all those. I, I knew nothing about that and I never d had done that. But the person who got me into it was Eileen Hull. Ah, Eileen. Well, of course, she's been a guest on this show and she is such an inspiration and so encouraging. Yes. And I met Eileen the funniest way because I was walking through like the licensing area of the show where, where she had a booth. This is before she was with Sizzix. So she had a licensing booth and uh, she was there with Laureen Mason. Right, the seamstress. And I was wearing these pants that I had made that were printed with photographs from my book since I was there 
<laughs> promoting my book. You know, I, I had the suit made, and I was, so I was wearing the pants. And they were like, who are you? you know, because you know, we have to know you because you're wearing these pants. So <laughs> I met them there at that show, and we became friends. But still, I, did, I didn't craft. And then several years later, you know, she got her deal with Sizzix and was making all these dyes. And I asked her, I said, what is the Sizzix? What are dyes? Is this something I should have? Right. <laughs> so she sent me, she had Sizzix send me you know, a big shot and then the dye of her cupcake wrapper because I was doing a lot of Tao cupcakes at the time. Uh huh. One of my favorite YouTube videos that I've done. So I took it out of the package and I used it and I could not believe it because you know, I was one of these novices who had never seen such a thing before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I put the paper in it and I you know, cranked it and it came out like this perfect thing. I had, I had never seen like a die cutting machine before and I was just blown away. And that changed everything. That changed my life. I tell Eileen all the time that her and the Sizzix Big Shot changed my life because from then on, I bought so many dies after that. And uh, one time I emailed Eileen and said, I'm so mad at you. And she, she thought I was serious, but I, I, was, I was mad at her because you know, she made me addicted to dyes. I was spending so much money uh, buying things for my you know, paper cutting obsession. To build these different crafts that you were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It kind of opened up a whole new world for me. Uh, and then I started doing uh, all these crafts and I love doing crafts now. It's great fun. Well, I love to play with paper. I, in fact, this one of the things I did this morning was just get out a little simple craft kit because I said, I got to do something with my hands this morning to get me all <laughs> set for the day. <laughs> so uh, after ironing and making my bed, I was very responsible. Then I played a little bit. Yeah, it's so fun to play. I think so. And you, you have a very nice, playful attitude and yet create such beautiful things. But they're fun, like the pants with the uh, cool pictures on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think I saw those, but, uh, um, you know, you've done things with all kinds of cool stuff, uh, uh, putting them on things like clothing and helping us transform our world a little bit, make it much more personal. And I like that. Technology is making that possible now. It's, it's just wonderful. Uh -huh. Maybe we should introduce you to a 3D printer. Oh, yeah. I've never used that. That would be fun. I'd love to see your creations <laughs> with one of those. <laughs> My husband and I have talked about getting one. <laughs> we Every now and then we think up an idea and say, hmm, maybe we should have a 3D printer. But you never know this, this whole creativity bug. And so what are the, are the things on the horizon that we should know about, about Jonathan Fong? Are you going to write any more books or... Uh... I have a couple of things in mind. Uh -huh. you know, one thing I haven't talked about is I have written a weekly column for the Jewish Journal here in L.A. for, for the past three years. Uh -huh. That sort of came out of your exposure in Israel, I guess. No, not no? at all. Related. It was no, so totally because, unrelated. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what a strange coincidence. Yeah, it <laughs> uh, is. Yeah, cool. So, so I've done a lot of projects for Jewish holidays. So I think I need to do a book on Jewish crafts. Oh, yeah, that'd be really cool. Well, I just around the time you had something, I guess LA had a Jewish film festival and you had uh, that, those uh, Star of David laced shoes or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that came out just at the time we were start having a Jewish uh, film festival here in Sacramento. So I shared that on Facebook because I thought, well, there might be people, you know, among my friends who uh, might want to have shoes that match the occasion. But yeah, so you have some real clever little ideas there that are, I think that'd be a great book. Yeah, because there really isn't a good resource right now uh -huh. for Jewish crafts. So, you know, I've done enough projects that, there that I can just publish what I've already done. Right. So, yeah, we're going into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur now, and I'm sure I'll have more projects for that as well. So, so that's one. And then, you know, I, I think I need to do a book of dog and cat crafts as well. Oh, my niece would love that. She dresses her animals up in costumes and stuff. I got, I got a shark costume for her cat because she's obsessed with sharks. But having a, a craft book of things for dogs and cats, I know of at least one customer who would be rushing to the store to buy that. And I'm sure among my friends and many others and many of our listeners, I'm sure would be passionate about doing that. So I think that's a wonderful idea. Yes, because you know, I have these two dogs who you know are oh, they're so cute. 
I'm always incorporating them into different you know things and uh, making things for them. So uh, yes, so some of my Facebook friends actually came up with the idea that you really should do a book for dog crafts, and well, I never thought about that, and I've already done so much stuff. So right, you have a lot of material to draw on there. I, I do. Yeah, well, we'll look forward to those. I think those would be really cool things to do. I think it's awesome. And I'm not sure, are there any other subjects here that we should have covered in the career of Jonathan Fong? Oh, you know, all I want to say is that who knows what else is on the horizon? Well, there's that, yes. Yeah, I'm on my third or fourth career now, and I I still have some years left in me, so I'm open to something else, too. (laughs) Well, that's great. Now, where can people find you so that um, my listener here wants to know um, how they can find you on the internet? So why don't you give me some places that people can find you? Oh, that's great. Okay. Uh, My website is Jonathan Fong Style. And that's Jonathan with an A at the end, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, fongstyle.com. That has projects. Then also, if you go to ehow.com, and search Jonathan Fong, you'll find all my projects there because I don't always put them on my website. And then on Facebook, I'm J Fong Style, and I'm also J Fong Style on Instagram. Great. And then your YouTube channel again, just to refresh people? It's J Fong Style as well. Okay. But the show is called Style with a Smile. Style with a Smile. Sounds great because I'm always smiling when I'm talking to you. And what we usually end the show with is just my guests' general thoughts about creativity, because, of course, the show is a creative approach. And so I was wondering if you had anything you wanted to share with the listener. Yes. Creativity is one of the most important things in this world. And I feel like for us creative folks or people who want to be creative, it's our duty to create because Creativity is the opposite of destruction. And there is so much destruction in this world. And so much of the world is geared towards destruction, both physical and spiritual. People want to tear each other down. People want to blow things up. And the opposite of destruction is creating. So however you create, you know, whether it's through crafting or cooking or building or painting or singing, uh, however you express yourself to create, you know, to make something that counteracts the destruction. And I feel it's our duty to counteract destruction. And it's a wonderful thing that we have this power and we can change the world by creating. So those are my cosmic thoughts on creativity. But those are beautiful, inspiring thoughts. And uh, I Thank you so much for sharing that. That's just wonderful. Well, I've had a blast talking with you, Jonathan. It's yeah. been great. And I'll uh, be looking forward to more of your creative ideas on the internet. And uh, hopefully, maybe I'll see you at the Association for Creative Industries in the future. But for now, we just want to say thank you for sharing all of your thoughts with us and your career. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It was so much fun. Thank you for listening to the show today. I've had a great time learning about Jonathan and his creative life. Links to Jonathan are available in the show notes at www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com. When you use Facebook, please visit and join our Creative Approach Podcast page. Your questions and feedback on the show are welcome on our Facebook group page. So do join us there as well. We love feedback and audio feedback can be sent on the podcast website. There's a little brown button on the side that says audio feedback. The website has had some improvements, so please check it out. While there, I hope you'll sign up for the email list. I hope to send a newsletter every one to two months. Now, I abhor spam and do not want to flood your inbox, but it would be a good way to keep you up to date with the podcast. Now, just a reminder to become a subscriber to a Creative Approach podcast on your favorite podcast platform if you've not done so already. The podcast is available on most, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and CastBox. If you'd like to support the show, even with $1 a month, your generosity would be most welcome. You can do this by going to the Patreon page on the website. 
Please join me at a Creative Approach podcast in future conversations where I hope you will find inspiration to make things, tell your story, and explore a creative approach to life.